We'll look at the, the events that were taking place before um, the uh, crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the bit that we've come to this morning is the Last Supper. Um, we celebrate it today in the church uh, as communion. Um, what I want to, to try and do this morning is to, uh, is to help us look at, at the Last Supper and particularly the way in which we take communion and see it rather from, uh, as we often do, from our point of view, but from the point of view of Jesus. Because really communion is about what Jesus has done. And I think sometimes we get a bit confused about that and we, we see it from our uh, perspective. If you've been watching the news lately, you'll, you'll notice that there's uh, been a lot of uh, a speak about selfies. Does, does everybody understand what they are? Where you get your... Oh, yes, you all know, don't you? You get your, you know, your, your iPad or whatever, and you take a photograph of yourself. And uh, it can be a bit like that, can't it, with our relationship we've got. It can be a bit all about us, about self. And of course, that's not really the right way, I believe, for us to see what God has done for us. We really need to see the, the marvel of our salvation and Christ's journey uh, to the cross and beyond uh, but to get a real good perspective and the right way of thinking, the right understanding of, um, uh, of, of Christ and the relationship that we have with him. So what I want to do this morning is to sort of turn our thinking around a little bit if I can. I'm going to sort of try and do that by using a couple of three sort of examples. So um, let's have a look at the, the first bit of the scripture, which um, you could put up there for me. This is what I call the, the sort of um, the invitation. The, now the, the, the feast of unleavened bread called the Passover is approaching, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the <coughs> And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted. <laughs> That's great, isn't it? Eh? And agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for the opportunity to hand Jesus over to them uh, when no pay was present. <laughs> okay. So just to sort of build a bit of a picture for you. Jesus had been going through his, his ministry, through his life, and he'd, he'd upset quite a few people. He'd actually blessed a lot of people, but he'd upset a few. And, and some of those people were the, the church leaders, the Pharisees, and, and, and those that were in a position. And the, they were starting to lose popularity. They were probably starting to lose money too, I suspect. But whatever way you want to look at that, there was this desire within the Pharisees, the, 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 the sort of important people of the day, to, to get rid of Jesus. Now they knew they couldn't just go and grab him off the street, because if they did, the chances are that there would be a riot. And particularly at this time of the year, if you were here last week, you'd have heard that, that there was a, they were preparing for the Passover celebration, one of three celebrations that took place at that time of the year. Its roots went right back into the time uh, uh, of when the children of Israel, or, or the, the Israelites, were, were slaves in Egypt. If you're as old as me, you've probably got a glimpse of that if you watched the, the film Moses. Yeah? More modern day, I think it would be the Prince of Egypt, as, as uh, produced by Dreamworld. Some of, you, some of your older ones would have watched that too because you'd have had to sit like I do with my kids and watch it over and over again. But that's where the Passover is rooted, in, in that event where God hears his people and sends his servant Moses to the Pharaoh and, and he has this dialogue going on with them and eventually it comes to the, to, the, to the pinnacle point where God decides that it's the right time to take his people out of Egypt and out of slavery. And if you're familiar with the story, it goes something like this. On this particular night, sacrifice the lamb, get its blood and put it round the doorpost of your house and the angel of death will pass over you. And so the, the, the Jewish people had had this celebration right from those, those many, many years ago. And it was being sort of celebrated at this point where Jesus comes in. That's the invitation. God had already put in place what he needed to, to prepare for what Jesus was going to do. 
I'm going to put it this way to you this morning. That God's plan is better than your plan. Okay? God's plan is better than your plan. Now, you may struggle with that, because I do sometimes, because I actually like to have a bit of control over my destiny. It's a gift that God has given me, really, because I have freedom of choice. But it's also I have to make a choice. And quite often I want to make that choice that, you know what, I prefer to go my way than God's way. But the truth of the matter is God's plan is better than mine. Let me give you an example of that. Let's go back to a few uh, months, days, whatever year, before the Passover, before this great meal. And Jesus asked his disciples this question. You may have come across this in your own Bible reading. He said, who do the people say that I am? And, and, and the, the, the uh, disciples start to respond. She well, some say that you're Elijah. And, and, and well, some of them say that John the Baptist raised back from the dead. And, and so, so forth. And then Jesus asked me, and he said, but who do you say I am? And Peter rises up quickly and he says, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah. You're the one, that, that the Redeemer, the Saviour. <coughs> Jesus says, yes, you're right. And then Jesus goes on to explain to those 12 people what's going to happen. He says, for the Son of Man must be handed over and be crucified and then raised again. And Peter dies in there and he says, that will never be. That will never be the case. And again, if you're familiar with the story, you'll know that Jesus turns to Peter and he says, Satan, get away from me. That's a bad day, isn't it, for Peter? Really? Oh, that knocked him sideways. I would hate to think that that you know, my endeavour, my effort to want to do right by God, he was going to turn around and, and, and call me the enemy. And uh, uh, of course you see that, that, that Peter goes away and he's trying to work all this out. But see, Peter's plan was that Christ should not go to the cross. Peter's plan that was, uh, even at this point, and we'll, we'll, we'll read it later on, where he's talking about being betrayed and denied, Peter's in there again saying, no, that'll never be, I'll die for you, I'll, I'll do this, I'll share your suffering with you, and of course, just rolls off the tongue. But that's not what God wanted, that's not what God had planned. The great thing about Peter and the rest of the, the, the disciples is that we see there is a change. If we, if we go further on into the scriptures, we see in Acts chapter 2, uh, actually, um, Chris, we can just put it up there. This is why I know that God's plan is better than man's plan. Because this is where Peter starts to change and accept that God is actually, uh, his plans are better. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God. Uh, to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did amongst you through him as yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purposes and foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing on the cross. But God rose him up from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Okay. By God's purpose. In fact, in the, in the, the uh, NIV, I think it says, by God's plan <coughs> that Jesus was handed over to be crucified. And you see that, that Peter now starts to declare this. Once he'd gone through that Pentecost experience, started to recognise that God's plan is better than his plan. And so I'll leave you with that this morning as we move on. The invitation. God's plan is better than ours. Then there's the preparation. Let's, uh, let's read on then, uh, verses 7 to 13. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had been sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparation for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? Or for it, they asked. And he replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. And say to the owners of the house, the teacher asked, where is the guest room? Where might I eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished, make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover meal. Okay, and just up to, we got to 13 there, sorry. Right. 
It's almost like a little sort of script out of a, a spy movie, isn't it? You know, the born identity, or I don't know, some spy movie. You know, if you go to this place, a guy will pass you over there and like, we'll give you instructions on it and so forth. A bit precarious, I reckon, don't you? You think about it. I don't know, I don't particularly want to do life like that. Where, you know, there's, there's some sort of uncertainty here. You know, the chances of meeting a man carrying a jar of water, it being the right man in a city where, you know, we heard last week there's three million people that have come normally, there's only 500,000 or whatever. You know, can you imagine that? It's like, as, as was said last week, it's like coming to Newport on uh, festival weekend. And, and somebody saying to you, there's going to be somebody carrying a, a, a rucksack on their back and some Wellingtons. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, hang on a minute. There's dozens and hundreds of people walking around with rucksacks and Wellingtons on. And, and, you know, I can imagine the disciples thinking to themselves, this man has really lost the plot here. <laughs> Except that they know Jesus to be right every time. And what I want to suggest to you this, uh, this morning is this, that God's word, Jesus' word, is better than our word. Better than our word. I've made promises to my kids and I haven't kept them. But say, you know, when, you, when your fifth birthday, I remember saying this to Joshua, I said, when your fifth birthday comes, I'll let you have a dog. <laughs> your fifth birthday came and went, and I didn't really want to have a dog anyway, because those of you that have got pets know that looking after dogs is hard work. And they, they came to well, Joshua came to me a few <laughs> months after and said, you, don't, you, you promised me a uh, dog and you didn't give me. Thinking, You're a liar, aren't you, Dad? <laughs> well, I'm not really a liar. I just, you know, wasn't going to do what I said I was going to do. Not necessarily unintentionally. But you get my point this morning, that we all make promises with good intention, with the right intention. We make promises to God <coughs> with good intention and right intention. We make promises to the people we love with good intention and right intention. But quite often, or from time to time even, we can't always fulfil those promises and those words that we've said. But this morning I want you to understand that whatever Jesus has said, whatever God has said, He will do. It doesn't matter how precarious it may sound, how fragile it may sound, how impossible, how impossible it might sound. Jesus and God, who is God, Jesus is God, will keep his word to the very end. I find it absolutely fascinating that, that the disciples have found this guy in a busy city, have managed to get a room in a busy city where all rooms would have been occupied because there would have been so many people there. It's like, again, going back to the festival, me saying to you, find a parcel of land where we can put a tent. It's almost impossible. Yet you know what? God had always prepared for it in advance. And if you're struggling uh, today, I don't know where, where you all are this morning, but I guess I know this much, that you won't get through this life without having some big questions to ask your God. You won't get through this life with relying on those promises that God has promised to you. And I, uh, I don't know where Matt is, I think he's out with the kids, but he, he said uh, uh, the, other, the other week when we were we're talking about prayer and he said, you know, what I, I, I've started to do is I've started to look in the Bible and find the promises of God, the words of God, and apply them to my prayer. What a fantastic way of praying. You know, I would suggest to you this morning that if you don't do that in some greater or lesser degree, then, then that, that really can be a fantastic way of starting to engage with God. Taking his promises and standing on them and relying on them. It might seem absolutely bizarre, just like you will go to the marketplace and find a guy carrying a jug of water. <coughs> but what's impossible for us is possible for God. The third bit is our participation. And if we can go on now from 14 to 23. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfilment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, 
this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine at the table. The Son of Man will go as he has been decreed. But woe to that man who betrays him. They began questioning amongst themselves which of them it might be who would do this. From this whole passage, this is, this is my favourite bit, I have to say. Because Jesus makes this announcement. He says, I have eagerly desired, I've waited for this time to come. And I guess what really Jesus is saying when we start to unwrap that a little bit is that, you know, his whole purpose, all of the miracles that he's done, all of the things that he's said, all of the great signs and wonders that he's shown, are really bringing us to this great point. This point where, where he's going to seal what he's come to do, and that is to die so that we may become in a relationship with God. That he may take our sin so that there is no separation any longer between us and God. This is his greatest act of love. This is the demonstration of, of that verse that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. So it's no wonder that Jesus is making this statement when he says to his disciples, and of course they don't have a, really a clue what he's saying at this point. They think they've just got together to, to go through the, like our you know, harvest supper or a Christmas meal together. You know, we're going to have a great time, we're all going to sit there. But he, he makes this claim to them. And, and it's rooted also in, in, in this, as given in Jeremiah 32. We can just share this with you. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action so that they will always fear me from their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them and I will inspire them to fear me so that they will never turn away from me. See, God had predestined Jesus Christ to be a new covenant. In Old Testament times, uh, or in these times, they, co covenants were sealed. They are still today, actually. If you have a covenant relationship with someone, say, if you're buying a, 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 a property, uh, in my surveying, we, we come across this from time to time. Where in a property, you'll have a covenant set on that, and that covenant might be something like this: you, you can't build a brick wall um, across the front of the building, say, uh, or you can't uh, have animals. Some people like to keep animals. Don't they? <laughs> uh, those will be covenants. Those will be be agreements that were set up, and, and and this is no different. But this covenant is one that is sealed with blood. This is an everlasting covenant. But you know, in the legal sense of the word, for a covenant to be effective, it has to be upheld. There has to be participants in it. And what I get from this passage here are two things. Firstly, that the covenant has already been established for us, a new covenant. One that is sealed with the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the second one is, is that we're upholding that when we join together in communion, which we're going to do in a few minutes' time. Because what we're actually doing, I believe, when we say that, is we're putting hold of these three things that, that I've mentioned to you this morning. First, we were saying, God, your plan is better than mine. Secondly, we are saying, Lord, your word is better than mine. And thirdly and finally, Lord, your love is better than mine. The Bible talks a lot about Jesus and his crucifixion. It talks a lot about the sacrifice that he makes for us. It talks about how, how God loved us when we were his enemies. It talks about how Christ allows himself to be crucified so that we no longer have to go carrying the burden of sin on our shoulders. It's a perfect demonstration of love. It's a perfect demonstration of grace. And for, you, for those of you that don't understand the full extent of grace this morning, I pray that and, and, and 
encourage you to talk to someone more about that. Because grace is about what God has done for you, not what you can do for God. So Jesus has done it all really. And as we share in communion together this morning, I want us to reflect on, on, on what God has done for us. How his plans for us are better than ours. How his word for us is better than ours. And how his love for us is better than ours. Let's pray and then we'll share.